We also uh, focus on practical content tailored for entrepreneurs to help them tackle real world challenges. By that we mean we do classes uh, for entrepreneurs on nuts and bolts of starting their company. We have a mentor program. We allow startups to come and pitch, uh, give their full 20 minute pitch in a very sort of non shark tank environment to actually practice um, before they go out and get um, funding. And then we do something called the Startup Spotlight, which is a program where we um, sh highlight uh, 35 startups around uh, Boston and the world uh, that we think are doing cool stuff. Um, these are a list of our many upcoming programs. Some of them are, are blocked Behind out us. here, so <laughs> apologize. Just look um, at all we're <laughs> available on our website. Um, at April 30th, we're doing a um, program on clean tech startups. We're doing uh, a VC perspectives on IP for biotech entrepreneurs. We're doing something on what general, what startups need to know on IP. We're doing a launch clinic on Internet of Things startups uh, on May 13th. Um, we have a healthcare um, entrepreneurship event on May 14th. We have our one of our Start Smart classes, which is that nuts and bolts class starting May 20th. And our startup spotlight is June 12th. We're currently actually taking applications for, th for those of you who are um, entrepreneurs in the space and want to get in front of about 300 people at District Hall, feel free to apply. Um, I do want to thank our annual sponsors uh, for supporting this event, Witham, Caldwell IP, Chen PR, Hamilton Brooks, Smith Reynolds, Morse Barnes Brown and Pendleton, and Wolf Greenfield. And also, um, this is part of our innovation series of events. Um, this is driven by volunteers who spend a lot of time and effort on this. My small staff of three cannot do this all. Um, so I particularly want to thank Jerry. Um, where's Jerry? Yeah. Yeah. Jerry has been a longtime volunteer. I adore working with him. Uh, just thank you, thank you, thank you for putting this together. <coughs> I also want to thank um, agency at CIC um, and Danielle for hosting us here, and I'll let her get up here and, and say a few words. But uh, we really appreciate these partnerships that we do um, with the various organizations around town, and so I'll let Danielle get up here and say a few words. Thank you, Danielle. Well, this is so exciting to see the room so full here at Agency. We just had our ribbon cutting a couple of months ago. This building that you're in is the brand new um, addition to the CIC Global Network. So we're thrilled to have this kind of creative energy and these brilliant minds convening here to talk about something that matters to all of us. Um, and personally, as someone who's been doing innovation for a long, long time in Boston, I'm so excited to have the MIT Enterprise Forum and agency working together on this event and to collaborate with Katya and Jerry and Amy and the whole team. Um, I attended my first MIT Enterprise Forum event many, many, many years ago and met Bill Warner, who is a very successful uh, entrepreneur and a beloved mentor to a lot of startups. And he talked about 
building a startup from the heart. And that was where everything starts. And it resonated with me then, and it really resonates now as I meet all of the startups that join agency. And I see our agency startups, they're nodding, right? Like, coming to this work, it's hard work. It's really hard to think about the issues that go along with growing older. At agency, we like to say we're leading with joy, not with shame. We are leading with possibility and designing for possibility, not designing for deficit. Okay, so with that as a frame, um, we're finding that startup founders come to this field from deeply personal experiences. It could be a lived experience, caring for their parent or their grandparent, and it, there was just a traumatic event along the way, and you just think, it's, there's just got to be a better way. Um, or it's a founder who actually already had their first career and uh, were very successful and then retired and then looked around and said, okay, well, it's got to be better than this. Um, and then comes back with uh, the, you know, a, lot, a lot of perspective and some great skills. And so, in fact, just this week, we launched the Founders Over 55 Club. So if anybody is interested in joining us on that journey, um, we're very excited to attract innovators from all sectors, all ages to this field because the world is aging and aging fast. And what do entrepreneurs love? They love solving wicked problems that can change the world. And regardless of your background, regardless of your own life experience, there's one thing we all share in common. There will be 7 billion people in the addressable market for aging at some point. Right? <laughs> we're, we, we're all in this together, folks. Um, and so, and it takes innovators at every part of the ecosystem. And that's, again, what agency is designed to do, is to help build capacity in the ecosystem, to help build the trusted relationships with one another so we can count on each other um, for really solid advice for product market fit. We can count on each other for prototyping. We can count on each other to help scale the best ideas. So let's take an example, um, dehydration. Okay, lots of research about older adults that get dehydrated. Okay, well, why is that? Well, the thirst sensation changes as you age, right? So is this a call to innovate for product designers to build better cups? Is it an, uh, a call to innovate to um, folks who do apps and sensors and IoT? Maybe it's something that connects to a caregiver and the caregiver is tapping like eight times a day, you know, mom, dr dr drink again, right? Is it a call to innovate for, um, uh, for hospitals, you know, to have something at the, at the hospital level to make sure that, that people are, are, are drinking more? Well, the answer is yes. Yes, indeed. In fact, all of those things are necessary. Well, but what if the real reason is that somebody isn't drinking enough and they're living alone because they're afraid and embarrassed about a possible episode of incontinence? Oh, so now we have another, a different problem that requires a whole different set of empathy and, and strategy. Right? And so what if that person is actually self-isolating because they don't want to go out, because now they're really afraid of having an incontinence effort episode out in public because they can't get to a bathroom? Oh, so is that a call to innovate for medical device manufacturers to come up with, you know, sonar bladder monitors connected to the phone that tells you GPS tracking when your bladder's filling up and how close you are to a bathroom. Well, sure, that would be cool. Um, is it a call to innovate for insurance companies to think about how to cover something like that? Yes, right? But what if the real issue is a call to innovate for lawmakers and business owners and urban planners to build more free public bathrooms into yes. the built environment <laughs> so that nobody has to worry about this. Guess what? Aging is a universal design space, right? What we solve for one population actually will be better for everybody. And again, that is the agency motto. Let's make the aging journey better for all. So I call upon everybody in the ecosystem, whatever expertise and skill you have, it can play a role in this journey. And we encourage you to meet some of the entrepreneurs, join a team, mentor a team, um, convene in places where people are talking about this. Let's remove the shame of growing older. Let's dwell in possibility, because as we say, growing older is inevitable, but dreading it does not have to be.
okay? So we are so excited to have this incredible panel here. These are folks who are in the arena. They are working hard in health care, in home care, senior living care. They are trying their, to um, bring amazing innovations to light. And um, we're so excited uh, to have their expertise and brilliance here. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Jody Holtzman, our moderator. I met Jody uh, when we were producing an uh, innovation event for AARP. Jody has decades of experience in this space, and he's now managing director of Longe Longevity Ventures, so he can say whatever needs to be said. <laughs> and we are so excited to have Jody lead our panel today. Thank you for being here, and thank you uh, for your collaboration. Uh So um, I wasn't aware that there actually was a mic on this, but I thought it was more performance art. Um, but okay. So um, it, for eight years, I, I built and led uh, the innovation program at AARP. Um, but before that, um, I was uh, the, uh, the head of research at AARP. That was an 85-person <coughs> group seven departments. There's nothing that AERP doesn't research, and that did not even include the Public Policy Institute, which did all the public policy stuff. But I was the first non-PhD social scientist to run the research group coming out of the corporate sector, coming out of strategy consulting, with an expertise around something called competitive intelligence. This is what brought me to the field of aging. And at that first uh, meeting of my direct reports, I had eight, eight uh, direct reports, every one of them a PhD social scientist of one type or another. The most wonderful, best-hearted people on the planet and anal to the 10th degree. <laughs> and uh, I said, so here's the deal, here are my mantras. Context is everything. Don't confuse data with reality and don't let facts get in the way. The field of aging is specifically perfect for the application of those mantras. And so maybe you can extract how they're applied at the end of this. So what I did want to focus on first was really context. So if you listen to the pundits in, in DC, there are two dominant narratives uh, that go on. One, and nobody will be blunt and put it like this, but the first one is we can't afford all these old people. <laughs> nobody will put it like that, but that's the core of the argument. And the second is, and besides, there are a bunch of greedy geezers. <laughs> and again, few will put it like that except for Robert Samuelson, the uh, columnist for the Washington Post. And so, um, but when you look at that, you know, for years, people would, you know, give me the essence of we can't afford all these old people. Uh, my graduate work at University of Chicago was in political economy. So if somebody's making an economic claim to me, I want to know what's the economic evidence. And they would say, oh, well, look, you know, Social Security, Medicare, they're unsustainable. The epiphany was they were making an economic claim we as a society can't afford. But their evidence was a design function of two programs, not economics, not economic data. But what it did do is beg the question, if that isn't the source of the economic data, what are the data? And so we created this concept called the longevity economy, something that a friend of mine here at MIT, Joe Coughlin, has gotten a lot of uh, good mileage out of. Um, <laughs> and um, we hired Oxford Economics and we said, here's the charge. If you were to envision a standalone economy, but this one was solely driven by the consumer spending of people over 50 years of age in the United States, what would the GDP of that economy be? And so if you envision a national economy, it could be any kind of national economy, United States, United Kingdom, China, Mexico, Barbados, any small, econo small island economy, wherever. They all have the same generic attributes 
of a failing economy or a strongly growing economy. So things like new business formation, job creation, productivity growth, tax generation, new ideas, innovation, disruption, new business models, investment, new markets, new industries, new economic value, demographic growth. By the way, there is no economic growth without population growth. Value chains, supply chains, multiplier effects. Every economy has all of these attributes, and then it's measured by GDP. So now envision this national economy, but this one serves the interests, the needs, the desires, and the preferences of over 115 million people who are over 50 years of age in the United States, and that is the longevity economy. And it is big. Because when Oxford Economics punched the button, they came up with a number of $7.6 trillion, making it the third largest economy in the world after the US and China, over $3 trillion larger than Japan. And this is the key. Going back to what is the claim we can't afford all these old people, 35% of the population is driving over 42% of total US GDP. $5.6 trillion in consumer spending, and 35% of the population is driving 53% of total US consumer spending to the point that it represents half or just under half of healthcare, durable goods, utilities, motor vehicles and parts, financial services, household goods, groceries, leisure and hospitality. Why is it important to look at all of that? Because those are industries in which people are making p purchases with goals that have nothing to do with ailments and the decline of aging. It's about living. And it's about getting up in the morning and having two lists. There's a list of the shit you got to do, and there's a list of the shit you want to do. And people go through life trying to get down those lists and to achieve the things that they need to and want to achieve. And they spend money doing it. So when you look at all of this, it begs the question, so what? Coming out of strategy consulting and competitive intelligence, I've always felt there were really only two important questions. What if and so what? And it's true here. So what about all of this spending? Well, it generates just under 90 million jobs. Well, those aren't just jobs for old people. Those are jobs that families across the country benefit from. $4.7 trillion in salary and wages. This is an important one. $1.8 trillion in federal, state, and local taxes. You know what we spend on Medicare? About $650 billion. But people over 50 generate, through their consumer spending, 1.8 trillion. And there are myths about who these people are. Twice as many startups are created by, uh, twice as many startups are created by people in their 50s and 60s than people in their 20s. One in three businesses started by someone over 50 in the past 10 years. This is MIT. You would think that all of the great patents in material sciences, IT, life sciences, would all be these Zuckerberg types, you know? And he comes from my county, Westchester County in New York. But the fact is, is that people over 50 account for 53% of all patents in IT, material science, and life sciences. And if you add people 45, 46 and up, 72% of all of those patents. And the average inventor age for what was deemed the highest value patents was 55. Well, the fact is, is that aside from social media, you actually need some world experience to be able to identify problems in the world. But one of the things that is also missing from all of the discussions in this space, particularly when it comes from the design side, from the supply side, is the demand side. What is the character scope and quality of demand and character of demand? 
Why should anybody pay for whatever it is any of you are doing? What is the value proposition? Oh, well, we're going to sell it to the boomer children because they need peace of mind. My mother doesn't give a hoot about my peace of mind. <laughs> and anything you want to put in her apartment, she has to agree to let you across the threshold. So you better have a different conversation and a different value proposition for that conversation than you have for me that's playing on my Jewish guilt. <laughs> Right? Particularly with my Jewish mother. <laughs> so, the biggest takeaway is that people, even my mother, 89, with dementia, gets up in the morning and hopes to have a new experience. Discovery, excitement, joy. Those are the things that bring quality to life. And everybody has that. And if innovators are not thinking about that, well then you're really going to face the one question that you never, ever want to hear from your investors, your board of directors, and for the VCs from your LPs, and that is, why did you leave money on the table ignoring the only humongous growth market that exists? So to me, it's time to have the opportunity conversation. So thank you. So they all have mics, I just have a big mouth. <laughs> um, Let's compete. So yeah. uh, why don't we start down, down at that end, we'll, we'll, we'll bounce it around. So uh, Cody, can you tell us a little about uh, yourself, the company, what you want these people to walk out of here knowing? Sure. Do I need to press this button when I, I guess it's green now, so green means go. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, my name is Cody Garguzlu. Uh, I'm the CEO of uh, Imaginostics. I made this company uh, in July. Um, Imaginostics is imaging plus diagnostics put together makes Imaginostics, although I like the imagination part of it. Um, and so, well, um, you know, I, I have an imaging background. I have uh, um, studied, uh, I've got a, um, two bachelors, a master's. Uh, my master's in biophotonics, my bachelor's was, uh, which is imaging with light. Uh, my bachelor's was uh, in physics and mechanical engineering. And for me, uh, you know, and then I invented uh, an imaging modality during my PhD and then later developed that and then uh, in a postdoc at Harvard Medical School. Um, and I made this company. And for me, uh, um, you know, I've always uh, pursued, you know, it is really a work from the heart, you know, this innovation. You know, I just have always pursued what it, what it is that, um, my own passions in life are in science, and then how can I, you know, uh, help people with that? And so, uh, when I decided to make this company, it was a little bit scary, but at the same time, because it's the unknown, you know, and as you know, fresh out of academia, we're not. And this is one of the problems with the young people innovating. We're not really trained to uh, necessarily think that way. Uh, you know, um, we're in academia. If, if you're passionate enough about science to do your to do a postdoc or even a PhD. Um, you know, it's you, 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 you don't think about, I'm going to make a company out of this. You, you, you know, there's 10-year postdocs and more and more uh, without applicants. So I wanted to make a company to bring something to people to help them. Um, and so uh, the, the company is for early detection of dementia. We map the vasculature in your brain. And, um, you know, it's the different biomarkers that we're developing. So that's what we do. I want to say something uh, just about Kendra here because she's, well, she's figuring out the technology. Uh, Thank you. Being from a tech company. Um, Can you hear me? Okay. And, and that is uh, uh, a, an earlier iteration of Pierre Coach was, was uh, one of the first finalists for a uh, live pitch competition uh, that my team put on back in 2012. We did it for six years. And over that six years, we had 1,100 startups just in digital health <coughs> and caregiving apply to be one of 10 on stage. And over those six years, we plucked 70 finalists. We added a, a, a second day in FinTech the last year. That's where the, the, the last 10 came from. In any case, 
Um, half of them have uh, raised well over uh, 200 million in, in venture investment. Some of them have pivoted. Some of the, some of them have iterated, but they're still kicking. We're here. Uh, so I'm, thank you. Uh, so I'm Kendra CV. I'm from Care Coach, which early on was Jerry Joy, if you've heard of us. Um, so I'm the clinical administrative director. I actually joined the team only about uh, nine months ago or so. Um, so I'm the only East Coast employee. Uh, I used to work for a PACE program here in Massachusetts where we were actually using our devices. And the product that we have is we have put digital pets in people's homes and are also using them as a bedside sitter. Something that makes us stand out um, our products stand out is that our devices are actually operated by live individuals 24 7 so we're an internet based tablet that again the individual using it is either seeing a dog or a cat and the dog and cat are providing psychosocial support and then also health coaching so our individuals that are using it in the community um, we're addressing social isolation and loneliness and then also just providing general health reminders such as medication reminders or um, also we have chronic disease programs that you can uh, incorporate into your program. So providing depression support, COPD, diabetes, and um, you can enroll in these programs. So it's your little cat or dog friendly, giving you these reminders throughout the day. Um, our live individuals are called health advocates that are available. So if the cat or the dog is awake, then that live person is there actually operating it. So we've nicely paired kind of a human in the loop and AI together. Um, we have found that this works well with the older adult population, um, specifically because we can understand them, we can ask multiple questions, we can adjust our programs. Um, we also do text-to-speech, so everything is typed out on the screen as well. Um, we found that we've been able to, in the community, kind of reduce ER visits or um, additional staffing visits. So we are uh, addressing the uh, kind of shortage of being able to provide older adults care going forward. And then in the hospital setting, we've also targeted delirium and falls. So by proactively asking questions and engaging the individuals by playing music, having just general conversations throughout the day and proactively asking questions, we've been able to actually show through our clinical trials that we've been able to reduce both the delirium and the falls um, so far. So that's kind of what we're doing at Care Coach. I'll take my switch. <laughs> Um, hi, my name is Moulet. Um, I'm the VP of IT at Benchmark Senior Living. Uh, we are a senior living company with 60 properties in um, New England and branching out down south all the way down to potentially Virginia. Uh, we serve about 6,000 residents and we have 6,000 employees. Um, we have uh, the 60 properties, we do assisted living, memory care, independent living, and skilled nursing. So it's kind of like the whole gamut of when you come into us, uh, you are uh, fully uh, able to do what you want to do. And typically what happens is a decline and we kind of manage that through the whole life cycle. Um, we, we like to say that actually we're not just in senior living because the way we define senior living today is we think that it's, a, it's not a, a viable product. Uh, the industry is moving so fast that we're not longer in senior living, we're more in the elevating human connection and actually taking care of people. And to understand that really is if you go back to, I've been doing this for about 15 years, so <laughs> you have to bear with me, but uh, 15 years ago, uh, senior living was really kind of like nursing homes. And, and even before that, it was all about nursing homes. And, and if, if you've ever been to a nursing home, it's not a really pleasant experience. And my background is really hospitality management. I was in hotel business. It was all about services, how to please people, uh, how to make sure that everybody has a really pleasant experience with, our, with their stay. And I kind of uh, realized that uh, um, nursing homes were completely different from that, right? But over time, um, the senior living industry went from real estate-based uh, kind of uh, goals to, to uh, care and hospitality-based. So it really kind of married, that's why I'm still in the same industry after 15 years, um, and I kind of found my calling, what we call the second paycheck for us, you know, we get paid a second way. Um, and that's because uh, really the whole, the whole experience is what matters to us. And so our lifelong uh, passion, or mine at least, uh, and for the whole company to be honest with you, mm -hmm. is really finding ways to remove all the things that we do that take us away from taking care of the residents. They're not patients, they're residents. Uh, they live there because they chose to. Um, and uh, it's an honor for us more than anything to have them live with us. Uh, what we call the fourth age, which is, you know, the 
people used to think, you know, 0 to 20 is you're a kid, 20 to 40, you're an adult, 40 to 60, you're a well, fully functioning adult, and then 60, well, I don't know what happens after that. Does this, does this in, in, in <laughs> include or, or, or not include crystals? Crystals? <laughs> uh, it's up to you. It's in your room. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> um, but for us, the 60 plus is what we uh, start to really look at. And actually, beyond that, the average age of a resident moving into our community changed from about 15 year, 10, 15 years ago, 80 years old to now 87. Um, and the average medication they take is about seven a day. Um, and but we want them to have a normal life, uh, what we call normal life, and um, uh, really help them throughout the whole uh, the whole stay with us. That's what we do. Um, is that all? Yeah, hold it. I have to get paid after this. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I'm, oh, I'm delighted to be here. As, as I'm hearing everybody speak, I, I wonder whether I'd rather be out there asking questions or actually telling you something about life biosciences, but. My name is Phil Lambert. I head up Discovery and Labs for a company called Life Biosciences. And we're interested in coming up with therapeutics for extending healthy lifespan. Um, how, did, how did we get there? Um, uh, my background, so I've been in biotech and pharma for a long time, discovered a number of different drugs for a number of different clinical indications. Um, and was in my first company that was somewhat connected to diseases of aging, which is a diseases of aging, what does that even mean? I mean, all diseases are, most diseases, except for the genetic ones, are even more prevalent uh, in aging. So diseases of aging doesn't really mean too much. But we, w we were looking at aging as a whole in terms of potentially therapeutics. Ten years ago, there was really nothing moving in that space. What I can tell you now, the good news for everybody is at a cellular level, we now know some incredible things about what happens to your body as you age. And it's not about how long you've been on the planet. It's about biological aging. It's about how old you are biologically. And we believe, and everybody sort of says to me, do you have the magic pill? Are you taking it? The answer is no and no. Um, <laughs> but we are working very, very hard to come up with it. And we believe we can change some of these things to actually impact the way you age. And that ultimately we, we think will impact those diseases <coughs> of aging or those diseases that most people by the age of 80 have, about 80% age 80 have some sort of chronic disease and that we can change uh, the occurrence of those diseases so if I if I give you one piece of information to live with uh, to leave with um, you know most of us unfortunately the last 10 years or so of our life tends to be pretty tough because of diseases that kick in um, if you live to a hundred years of age if you're a centenarian the the cost of your end of life, shall we call it, healthcare, is only about a third of what it is if you die around the, at the age of 70 or 80. Those people somehow get out there with very little happening to them. And if you question these folks, interestingly, you would expect them to say, yeah, and I, I didn't smoke, and I didn't drink, and I worked out every day, but they don't say that. <laughs> Just, you know, they all drank, and they smoked, and they didn't work out every day, <laughs> and, and they still made it out there. So our, our goal, our holy grail would be that everybody should be able to go along and really compress that end stage of life. So it's not, it's not about how long you live. It's about what everybody's saying here. It's about quality of life. It's about quality of life at all those stages. Everybody involved in our business has a passion for you know, changing that. And we're doing it, I'll, I'll give you one last little piece about the company because it's pretty unique in terms of structure. Um, Daniela, who, who I met early on in this process. Our company's only been going about two years. Um, but rather than hooking into VC, and I apologize if there's any VC in the audience, I, I don't mean to insult you in any way at all, but... Your hand doesn't have to shake. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we, are, we are not funded by VC. Um, we took an approach to say, well, who's, who's really interested in solving this problem? Solving the problem, not making money out of the problem, but actually right. solving the problem, actually coming up with a drug. And the answer is all of us, right? Um, now, there are some of us that have a lot of net worth, a lot more net worth than the rest of us. And we have tapped those people to say, if you want to change the world, if this is the biggest thing you could possibly do. You should put money into this. And that's how we're funding our business right there now. Those people are stepping up and putting money behind it. Part of it's because they want to change it for themselves, right? They look at what, what could possibly go wrong for them. Well, they're heading into that fourth, fourth age, fourth age, <laughs> right? And that's what that's what they need to change. So, 
Um, we also take on a little bit of how do you use the young folks and maybe the, the slightly more mature folks like myself to get this job done. And so we, we suck all these fantastic I ideas from academia, but that we funnel them into our organization here in Boston, which is, is full of drug discovery and development folks like myself who are actually going to turn these things we hope into a therapy. Because the ideas come out of academia, but the academic folks don't know how to turn those into into a company and a drug, and that's what we do centrally here. So we we bring that whole group of people together who are working on aging and see if we can ultimately transform it into a, a therapeutic that'll, that'll change everybody's fourth age. Let me just uh, pick up on, on Phil's question more generally, get a sounding of the room. So uh, who in the room are, uh, is an entrepreneur? Uh. All right, who's an investor? Other. <laughs> Cambridge. Cambridge. <laughs> um, interesting. So I'm, I'm like looking for, for where um, the, the tie-ins are uh, here. And, it, and, the, and the context, I, I, I think, is important. I mean, Malay, um, yeah, I love the fact that you're out of hospitality. I think actually the most exciting thing in senior living uh, has to do with uh, uh, music, booze, and fun um, because that is the frame and positioning of what is the most successful new senior living player on the, on the, on the, uh, on the chessboard, and that's Jimmy Buffett. <laughs> who has created um, uh, Latitude Margaritaville. <laughs> mm -hmm. They have a thousand person waiting list. And this gets back to this other point uh, that I raised earlier, is, is that you know nobody wants to focus on decline. Right. I don't get up in the day and say, oh yes, please keep talking to me about my bad back. <laughs> I mean, you know, no, I want to forget that. You know, deal with right. it take a pill, <laughs> strap on an exoskeleton, whatever it is, but I want to right. focus on what, what's the bright side of, right. of, of the day, and that's an right. entire brand right. around, you know, fun, upside, you know, life, living. Um, but isn't that because you don't sincerely feel nobody can address these issues for you? So let's skip it and let's get on to the other side of the coin. Hmm. Which issues? The health you issues. Want, you want to repress all of your concerns about your your problems. Yeah, I, I wouldn't use repress, but certainly look at them in the rearview mirror. But uh, that may that may be part of it. I think it's 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 more about that. You know, just like my mother, she wants to get up every day and have something new. We we, we want newness, mm -hmm. and it seems to me that one of the things that ties together some of these things. I heard I was I co-produced a a conference a couple of weeks ago down in Sea Island, Georgia, a place I used to think that you needed a passport to go to, but it turns out you don't, uh, being a New York snob, but um, absolutely gor gorgeous place. And it was a, a health conference, and one of the things I, I heard uh, Brenda Schmidt of Solera say was um, that health happens in, uh, healthcare happens in, in the doctor's office, health happens in between visits. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and that, to me, is an important construct. The same thing that only 20% of your, your health care is actually medical. The other 80% is everything from genetics, social determinants. The best phrase, by the way, you know, one of the big fad terms in, in health care right now is social determinants of health. I thought a much more useful phrase that she actually used was social barriers to health, mm -hmm. which I think actually then gives you a focus of what to, what to address. So I want to tie together drugs, and by the way, the fastest, biggest growing consumers of cannabis are people over 60. Um, and now it's legal in Massachusetts. Um, check out Brookline, it's the only recreational dispensary. Um, in any case, um, drugs, senior living, help for people who might be living in senior living, and Cody, you still have to like give another push as to 
what is going to happen with this brilliance. Yeah, sure. Um, actually, I'd love to. I guess, uh, you know, uh, I didn't know how long or short I should have been. So I introduced myself. Hi, I'm Cody. Thank you. <laughs> um, and uh, I don't know. I feel like uh, I just have a, I have a newborn, you know. She was born uh, March 20th, number two. Oh, and nice. uh, I uh, thank you. And uh, you know, it just reminds me you gotta keep on your toes. I guess I was expecting to to give a talk tonight, so just keep it short. You know, keep on your toes with the kid. You know, you're trying to change the diaper, and then you got it coming at you. So I've always, I always carry a shield now, <laughs> and um, <laughs> so so I'm just I'm just winging it. But um, yeah, so um, man, I uh, I can tell you more about what we do, but just on my mind as we talk about uh, decline, you know. Um, you know, cognitive decline. What, what I am, you know, we at Imaginostics, we are designing uh, new biomarkers to be able to visualize what's happening in the brain because we have all these drugs that fail. I think Biogen just had another failure. Um, there's, you know, over 360 or so drugs, you know, for aging that fail. Um, and we, we, we have no real way to look in, first of all, we have no way to find out who needs the drug. Um, early, right? Uh, if we start treating people who, who have Alzheimer's disease, their brain's already, uh, you know, in the state of uh, degeneration. And so it's something you want to treat early, right? Early. So how do you get people uh, early? Well, we, we don't know how to find them. We have no biomarkers for these diseases, for aging. And, you know, in age, you know, uh, you know we say age-related dementia because it's really a continuum. Uh, to, you know, if, if you're lucky enough to die in your old age, uh, you will, one in third chance you will get, one out of three chance you will die with Alzheimer's disease uh, because it's a disease of aging which is, you know, uh, worsened by, you know, genetic and environmental factors, but, but it's happening. Um, and so there are no uh, uh, biomarkers right now. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, since 1904, for example, in Alzheimer's disease, which is 70% of dementia, um, uh, you know, we, we've known that there are these plaques and tangles in the brain, you know, right? The amyloid plaques and tau tangles. And so we've been targeting those and it's, it's, we focused on it and depending on, you know, which association you go to, you go to the Alzheimer's Associated, you know, meeting, you go to the Cure Alzheimer's Fund meeting, go to the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery meeting, everybody's talking about something else. And I'm not, you know, but, but some people are so focused on it, you know, but, you know, we're, we're and, and then now we have biomarkers for, uh, you know, amyloid, and we have uh, through PET imaging, we can image amyloid in, in your brain, positron emission tomography. There's a study called the IDEA study going on since 2013, sort of a big deal. The Center for Medicare, uh, Medicaid Services uh, injected $80 million in it out of the 100 million funding the study. Um, it, you know, they had two specific aims, it's almost all done. And basically they wanted to see, you know, uh, one, uh, in three months, uh, within three months time, if you get that imaging biomarker, um, you know, are you gonna be prescribed something different? Will there be a change in your, uh, you know, what it is that we prescribe you? Yeah, there, there are, you know, the 60% of the time, they're aiming for 30%, and now they're trying to find out a specific aim too, you know, can you also save money? Which is what the CMS really cares about, because if they're gonna uh, pay for something, then they wanna know that they're gonna also save. And so, you know, 2017, we paid $280 billion for caring for people with dementia. And so, you know, and, and if that comes from the tax paying dollars, Medicare, Medicaid, and so on, or whatever it is, I mean, it's just a waste, right? And then, uh, you know, I could go on and talk about that because meanwhile, where do you get innovation? You get it, you know, primarily from academia and that's funded with, you know, $40 billion a year, you know, to the NIH. And then how much of that actually goes to, you know, uh, age-related cognitive decline and so on. So there are these, you know, biomarkers. Uh, so what, and, and so, you know, cerebrovascular disease is the second leading cause of dementia. Um, and so, you know, 50% of dementia, we know that there's a vascular pathology in the brain. So there's actually some, you know, in 92%, you know, up to 92% of dementia, um, you know, everything except for frontotemporal degeneration. So Lewy body dementia, Alzheimer's dementia, vascular cognitive impairment. Um, you know, we, we know that there's cerebrovascular disease as a component inside of it. And so it makes sense that you would have a vascular biomarker. And, you know, uh, you know, I was reading a New York Times article and the clinicians, what one of the clinicians was talking about, say, we know it's there. We know these things are happening, vascular disease and so on. It's not a dirty little secret. We just don't know what to do about it because we can't see it happening. And so I invented, you know, uh, an imaging modality that using MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, 
where you can come along and actually map the vascularity in the brain and all these kind of cool biomarkers where you transform the MRI machine from sort of a semi-quantitative device that gives you uh, a signal which doesn't relate to physiological information to instead, you know, a signal that does relate to the amount of blood in that area. Although there are some nice techniques in MRI such as arterial, you know, arterial spin labeling, DTI, uh, other things, you get the blood flow, you can look at the axons and the white matter and so on. Um, you know, but, th but, th but they're not biomarkers that are, uh, enable us to, uh, you know, uh, pick people early for uh, clinical trials um, and then follow to see whether or not those drugs are working. Um, you know, and so uh, basically what we've done so far is, um, you know, preclinically in a APOE4 uh, knock-in model. So in preclinical models, we've shown that we can actually visualize this continuum of vascular changes. Um, and so, and it's interesting, re really interesting actually too as well what you see. Um, and uh, you know, you actually see hypervascularity early on as maybe an, uh, me a compensatory mechanism for the brain uh, for metabolic dysfunction and then hypovascularization as we would expect toward, uh, you know, neurodegeneration and so on. Um, and then, you know, in humans, what we've done now is we've uh, developed a, the, our software. So we just finished this milestone where we're now ready for uh, clinical trials. And so there's a lot of research, there's a heavy research and development. You know, we've range, uh, raised angel investment and we blew through our milestone of preparing for the clinical trials, which, uh, you know, is technical uh, stuff. And essentially what we have is a software that you can put on an MRI machine. And then, you know, we have, you know, quantitative vascular biomarkers. There's five of them that are distinct. Uh, you know, including assay of the microvessel density, uh, looking even at blood-brain barrier uh, breakdown, um, you, know, uh, you know, an interesting functional connectivity uh, technique and so on. And so, you know, it's, it's, we, and, 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 and we really hope that this will be much more sensitive uh, than what, what exists. And so, you know, the idea is, you know, if somebody comes in with, you know, perceived mild cognitive impairment and there's three and a half million of those people per year and 500,000 of those will be diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease that year, um, that, and they already get an MRI anyway if, if, it, if it goes on. So, um, you know, with this MRI that you would be able to map the brain and hopefully have a biomarker that would tell you something more quantitative and throughout the whole brain where it's happening and, 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 and predict future costs uh, associated with that and, and help people plan for, for the future. So. so the What's the business model? To, to the business model? Yeah. But also, I, and, and then to tag on to, to give you all a, a heads up, you know, what is that one takeaway as an entrepreneur, mm. that lesson that folks in the audience might find useful? Well, one takeaway, well, first of all, uh, the business model is it's a software that gets put on the MRI scanner, so you have licensing. And then there's also, uh, you know, and it's interesting now, the MRI companies, you know, they have app stores now. So, you know, you can, uh, you can go through their app store even to get that, uh, that uh, product put on there because that's at the end of the day what it is. It's a software that controls the equipment, uh, makes it take images in a different way uh, because you can't just look at old images. It's not a new way of analysis. It's a new way of taking new data, you know. Um, and then, um, you know, and then reconstruct those images, do the analytics and so on. So you got that uh, software licensing and then also off-site uh, data analytics and there are CPT codes for that. So, um, you know, and it's complicated. So the message to take away is that sometimes you have to create business models. Somebody said healthcare is. It, yeah, some, well, I mean, if you look at the ideas study that's been going on funded, funded by the CMS, they're trying to figure out whether or not there should be a CPT code for reimbursement for early detection. Because some could say, so what? You know you have it, there's no drugs, so what, who wants to know, you know? So that, so it's complicated. If there's not a CPT code for early detection, you look at other, other things. So that's so the takeaway, so you gotta build the model. So the Alzheimer's uh, uh, detection space <laughs> is, uh, is very active. Uh, I was an advisor to a company called NeuroTrack, uh, which uh, has a diagnostic, it's digit-based, it's technology out of Emory, uh, uh, Emory University. And um, what I find fascinating, again, this speaks more to the business model than the strengths and weaknesses of different methodologies, but it gives you a sense of you know, how to think about where that end market is. They just did a deal with Daiichi Life Insurance Company of Japan, which has 40,000 salespeople on the ground 
And they realized that if they could identify those premium holders that had Alzheimer's and they could intervene in their lives at a er much earlier state, the crass takeaway is they live longer and they pay, pay premiums also longer. And so you have 40,000 salespeople now move, walking around Japan giving this particular Alzheimer's test. But the interesting thing to me was this is the first example of a digital health company partnering with a life insurer rather than a health insurer. And it does speak to how health and wealth really are at a nexus, but so usually not, you know, not, not directly, you know, addressed. Yeah, I, I guess one thing, just one, you know, thing I'll add to that is that if you knew early on, what could you do now, you know? Um, there, there was this so-called, there was this Sprint Mind study that was uh, released their results uh, in July, and they found uh, that by simply decreasing the blood pressure below 120 millimeter mercury, um, they decreased the rate of uh, mild cognitive impairment by 19%, which is better than any anti-amyloid drug or, you know, any drug out there. So cardiovascular exercise, and, and it's, it's, it's really interesting, or, or, or just managing your blood pressure, really. But um, so if you want that magic pill, where is that? Look at the treadmill and try to do, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's what's up, because it's true. It really is, you know? Your brain changes. Your cognitive you goes listen, up, too. If you listen to Hoppy Cohen, who is the dean of, of the uh, School of Gerontology at, at uh, USC, he says, exercise, Mediterranean diet, drink a little red wine, get plenty of rest. Yeah, that's, I, I, don't think that's, I, I don't think those will ever go away, even when we, cut, you know, <laughs> even when we come up with drugs. The, the, thing that it ma the thing that it made me think about is, and, and it's, as we think about aging, this is always an interesting question. I, I, I'll throw it out to everybody. But in healthcare, you, you're right. Aging and age specifically has been thought about in other industries much more than it really is in healthcare. Because how, how do we approach age in healthcare? Well, we do pediatrics because kids are different from adults, so we have to worry about pediatrics. And then Which is requi a required course of study for med students, where right. geriatrics is not. Right. But even then, what, what do we do between then and geriatrics? We put our head down, hope for the best, and, and do nothing. Right? Really, as far as aging specifically is concerned. And most people in the room would say, you know, you avoid taking, you know, if you, the longer you go without taking drugs, the better, right? Because people perceive that taking, a dr taking drugs isn't a good thing because taking drugs means you're sick, and so you want to avoid that as long as you can. We're looking at it and saying, well, you should be thinking about how you age, at, you know, from, from much earlier on, ultimately. But the problem is just, just what we said. If, if I tried to convince you to do that now, you'd come right back and say, but why? Because I can't do anything about it. That's the point, right? Why would I consider it right now? The best I can do is, you know, keep my diet under control, exercise whenever I can, get more sleep, all the things that it's hard for all of us to do, and, and you know, take breaks away from stress. All of those things are good. I, I don't think those things w would ever be bad, but there, there isn't much else you can do about it. So everybody sort of puts their head down, and if you don't get sick, you don't go to the doctor. Um, we believe there's gonna be things you're gonna be able to do, but you're gonna have to do them probably earlier to have the biggest impact, and you can't even do that today. I couldn't even convince the FDA today, even if I had the magic pill in my pocket, that anybody who wasn't sick would take it. They won't, they won't approve that. They won't let us do that as Pre of today. Pre preventive. Right. Medication. Yeah, preventative uh, medication that's actually a prescription med. You can do it with a supplement, but with a prescription medication, you can't do that today. Not, not possible because the FDA won't approve that because too much risk. You're, you're a healthy individual. Um, underlying, though, you're aging. You are a healthy individual if you've not been diagnosed with a disease, but you're aging. That's an interesting So all I'm going to say is, can you hurry up? <laughs> yeah, that part's really, really hard. I don't know. <laughs> Malay, uh, so um, one of the things you noticed when, uh, about uh, entrepreneurs and startup companies in, in this space, and I'm going to ask you a question to see as well, thank you, um, is when people are trying to think about what, what are the channels that uh, of distribution that they're you know going to go after senior living is, is, is a big one and there's an assumption that you know from 
uh, remote monitoring mm -hmm. value proposition very clear. You can you know prevent falls or mitigate falls, yeah. saves money, keeps people out of the hospital. Average day, average uh, time in, in senior living is about two years. Right. You know once they're gone, they're gone. Right, right. You lose that rent. So um, there's a there's a clear value proposition for senior living to be experimenting with a lot of the technologies mm -hmm. and, and things. I'm an advisor uh, uh, to Intuition Robotics, which has LAQ, yeah. its companion robot, which definitely for, for certain you know, profiles you know, is, is really absolutely, absolutely wonderful. So again, thinking about like there are entrepreneurs in, in, the, in the audience, uh, you know, what, when should somebody come to you and what do they need to have before they're not wasting your time and theirs? Yeah, so we, we talk to a lot of inventors and, and, and uh, startups. And um, we, about three years ago, we really got into, we want to talk to them. We really want to be at the forefront of technology and solutions that people are coming up with. And uh, over the past two or three years, I've really noticed three groups of people, uh, of inventors, if you will. You got the new startup company who actually comes up with the product and then says, hey, maybe this could work with seniors. So they have never even built it for seniors in the first place. Then you have the, the, the ones who have built it for seniors but not for senior living, which is a completely different setting. It's not the same thing. Selling to somebody who is 75 years old in their homes is not the same thing as selling to somebody uh, who is part of a community where we have 60 to 220 units, uh, rooms <coughs> that people live in as part of a community. So it's, it's a different setting. And then you have the people who have actually created for senior living. It's built for senior living, uh, designed for it, and uh, they thought through all the different things that, the different challenges that we have. I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, a lot of companies and communities are going into implementing Alexa or Google Homes in their, in their well, Google Home, what's in the word Google Home? Home, right? It's made for you, right? Not a senior who's in the community. You put 60 Google Homes in the community, the moment you say, okay, Google, turn off the lights, the whole thing shuts down. <laughs> <laughs> and they never thought about it. So we contacted Google and said, you know what would be cool <laughs> is if you're allowed to create this where we can actually connect to, you know, with the voice to different uh, accounts and actually not shut down the whole community because you said, okay, Google, turn off the lights. And they're like, huh, we never thought about this. Um, and that's what happens. And we get a lot of those. So when we talk to uh, uh, companies who say, hey, we have this great, great idea, I always tell them, you know, how'd you come up with the idea? And if it's, you know, oh, we did this for uh, a sports club <coughs> and we thought there may be seniors who want to work out with this, we're like, well, you know what? You didn't even design it for seniors. They're 95 years old. They can't necessarily run the way you want them to be running or whatnot. Um, and so, Th that we kind of we cannot weed them out. It sounds sounds awful, but we kind of tell them you know come back with an actual, take the uh, the core idea and apply it to senior living, and and the best way to do that is to actually pilot a first of all design it for seniors, and then test it out with seniors, and then you can say okay we're ready to kind of pilot in a bigger setting, uh, for you know in senior living itself. Just your, just your point about uh, you know we developed it for right. sports or something, right. and and now we're we're applying it. The one company that did that in reverse is Posit Science, which uh, has Brain HQ, uh, started by Dr. Mike Merzenich, who received the equivalent of the Nobel uh, Prize for Neuroscience, literally wrote the book, discovered adult brain plasticity. You know, it was always believed that only children had plastic brains and therefore they could you know, develop. He discovered it and that this was something that stayed with you for life and therefore, like any other muscle, you work it, you can, it, can, it can change. So they developed that for old people originally. And well, the last six back. years they've been doing customized brain games for Tom Brady. So yeah. uh, can I? Yeah, I also Kendra, take you back in. also on um, your comments. I agree, and I think one piece of advice that I'd have to give to you is not only come up with your product and trial it with older adults, but also have the part of the actual process. Mm -hmm. So going so to individuals, and um, we have run our product and you know put one in front of them and had and them actually. Let's be clear. Interested. The founder of, of your company, Victor, mm -hmm. uh, created this because of his grandmother. For his grandma. Yep. Right. Yeah. So he's actually an MIT grad. And his idea came from seeing his grandma abroad, um, struggling to live in the community, and saw the effect of loneliness. And so really started to he tap into- He was here, into, she was in China. Yes, yep. Yeah. So started to tap into talking actually to older adults, going to older adults' homes, going to senior centers, and actually talking to individuals. 
and hearing the feedback. So our type of technology has a lot of that initial feedback um, incorporated into it so that we didn't have to kind of fail later on or you know get some feedback of our pilot programs because we were able to actually incorporate that really early on, which saved us a lot of time and trouble, I think. So I would recommend really bringing individuals into um, your products early on to get that feedback. So, Phil, um, I, I think it's great that um, you've kind of charted a, um, a, a, a path independent of venture investment. Um, but I'm guessing it has its own uh, unique qualities yeah. uh, and, and, and challenges, right? Um, yep. what, why don't you share? Some, some of those for those thinking, oh, I'm just going to go tap, you know, some billionaires. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, th that's, a, that's a really good point. And you, it's, it, it's a throwaway comment to say that we're doing it that way and, and, and that it's going to work. Because it, it, it's, it's very hard to get money from anywhere. Raising money is very, very tough. The entrepreneurs in the room who have ever tried to do that will, will know that. Raising money is, is very, very hard. And, and Every penny you get, you should be proud to get because it's not easy to do that. Um, nor is it easy to get that consistently from the same folks. So even folks who we, you know you would look and say, wow, they got a lot of spare money. Uh, <laughs> no, nobody seems to have spare money, even if you've got billions of dollars of it. And um, th there's a, a real process that's involved in terms of how you have to uh, bring those, those, those folks along. By that I mean, you know, if, if somebody's in on, on your Series A financing, they're not going to come in on the Series B just because they still think this aging idea is a great idea, unless you unless you can show progress, unless you can show movement along. Particularly in the in, in the drug business, in the therapeutic business, it's all about time. It's about time because patients are waiting there, and that's that's critically important. It's about time because um, you run out of money. You, you you flat run out of money. So. Um, it, it's still very, very hard, we, we, and, and it, it's something that we have to look at all the time as, as we spend money because you know, we're, a, we're a discovery organization, and so we don't make any money. We just, we just spend money as we're working through this whole process, um, and we spend other people's money. Um, and so it's, you know, it, it's, it's definitely hard. We like it um, out of the gate. The reason I like it, I've, I've been part of a number of different VC-backed companies, and, for me as the scientist, what, what's disappointing about that, it's not, not that it doesn't work with the VC, but the VC is ready to get out at a sort of a financial inflection point, which is somewhat short of actually changing the world. So if you, if you really want to change the world, you sort of have to reach past that to some degree. And we felt as if this was, you know, was maybe a, a, a way to do it. But, um, you know, there, there are seemingly a good number of people out there with, with a lot of money to spend, and what better to spend it on than this, but there's a lot of things to spend so, on. So just a very practical uh, uh, example. When you, when you have investors, VCs, right, there, there's gonna be clear milestones, and it's gonna be milestones even to just you know, yeah. bring down what's yeah. already been committed, but it's being let out with an eyedropper, yeah. when, depending on whether or not you hit those milestones. So you have a round, anywhere from one, two, five, maybe max people are in the syndicate. And yep. um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a manageable number. So how, how to like miles, hitting your milestone, communicating, how does that work? Yeah, I think that, so for us, it's literally moving those ideas. I mean, I, I could, if I threw up on the board here all the ideas we have from the, from the smartest minds out there, if you like, in aging right at the moment, you, you'd think we were very close to, to, to having something going on. You, you, you know, we, I could wow you with all of that. But there's critical milestones that go with moving that to ever be in a therapeutic, to be in a drug, to actually ever being in people and making a difference. We set those milestones, we have to hit those milestones, and most of these programs will fail. Most of them, most of them will, will fail. So the, the, the other nice piece to our business organization is we have multiple projects. We're not focused on one horse. We have multiple programs coming in. If, if you look at the literature, this, if this is something interesting to look at. Oh, if, if you're a science geek like me, it's interesting to look at. But there's, there's eight or nine different physiological processes that have been identified as, as underpinning aging. And they show them typically in, the, in a wheel format. We have this wheel up on the wall in our office space. 
Um, it's pretty cool. And, and what we want to do is we want to have a, a project hitting on at least one project, more than one if we can, hitting on each one of these aspects. Because we don't know today which one of those is going to really change the game. Um, yeah, that they're, um, the, the way they're written out, they're things like senescent cells, these cells in your body that have aged, and they, they age for good reason, but probably at some point you don't want them around anymore. Um, there's metabolism, the idea of, you know, that your metabolism changes as you get older. There's um, things like autophagy. Autophagy is really, you can think of that as the way that cells, that's the cell's recycling system, how it cleans everything up. Autophagy declines with age. You're not cleaning up as well as you were before. We, we, we can improve that, we can improve. Um, there's there's um, eight or nine of these, I think eight we say in the US, nine they say in Europe, of these, of these physiological pieces that add up to, to, to all the parts. Um, and they change the aging of cells and they change the aging of the body. Um, and you know, we, wanna, we wanna go after each one of those and we have companies that are focused on each one of those, but um, they, they each have to have milestones and then you have to stick to those milestones. Um, you have to be hard and fast on milestones or, or else you, you, know, you run out of money. Let's uh, just uh, switch the, the focus here a little bit um, to the demand side. Um, and then I'd like to just open it up and just kind of let's get a free for all going. <laughs> so Malay, um, one thing I'm curious about, you've been in the industry for 15 years? Um, how, how, what, describe the change in who is coming to your facilities? Um, well, before, it was a lot of independent living and assisted living. So, you know, people who just wanted to say, you know what, I'm retiring, I want to live in a community uh, that uh, corresponds to my grid of ill, that corresponds to my values and, and and this still happens. Um, the the market is ch changes over time. I mean, I went through the 2009, you know, uh, crisis, uh, recession, and um, before that, it was a lot of independent living, and assisted living. And we realized that the big market is really memory care, dementia management, um, and and um, so that 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 big current is happening, right? So a lot of people's medication management. What is wasn't happening. In independent and well, in, in independent living, you, you uh, if, if I can explain the setting very quickly, independent living is you basically buy an apartment that is part of a big uh, complex, and you live there. And there's all kinds of programs for seniors, and um, it, you don't really need any medication management. You don't have, you know, you don't have any continence problems or anything like that. It's you're just living your life. You're typically between 75. Are and you doing your own cooking? Uh, you can, yeah. Uh, it depends on the, the, the communities, but you could have a small kitchenette in there. But there's, there's restaurants downstairs. There's typically a hospital not too far, but you don't really need it. Um, there's golfing. There's all kinds of co activities that you would do because um, you are mobile and everything's great. Um, but as your age declines and you start to get older and, and uh, your functions are start to get impaired, um, that goes into assisted living. So assisted living is really... Uh, there are different levels within assisted living, of course, but to, to, you know, in general terms, you need some help, you need somebody to come and help you out here and there, um, but it's nothing, uh, there's no dementia going on at the same time. So you, you're fully cognitive, you, you, you're fully aware of what's happening, and you just need some help here and there to be reminded some medication, or you want to uh, help, you know, you help because you, you, you have uh, mobility issues and things like that. And then memory care is where things really kick off uh, even more. And typically, so the big move is people who come into our communities uh, for memory care um, and dementia issues. Uh, it's really because the, 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 the adult child, and you have to think the adult child is about seven years old. The adult child is, just can't take care of their parents anymore. Uh, and they basically have this guilt and they say, I can't take care of them. Can you please you know, uh, help me out because I, I'm, I'm done. And what they try to do sometimes is have uh, nursing home, the nursing uh, uh, at, at home, um, and they realize it's a lot more costly than, than they thought it was, and it's a lot more uh, engaging, and it still requires <laughs> their their involvement. And when you're seven years old, you have your own life to worry about, and and uh, and you kind of want to be able to put uh, your, your mom or your dad in a setting that you really know that you know specialize. We know what we're doing. That's what we do for a living. 
Um, and they, sometimes people just have no clue what to do. And they, like, they come to us and they say, we, we just, we just, I don't know what to do. Uh, I can't take care of him or her, and I need help. Um, so in the, in the worst case scenario is when you have a combative parent. You know, they, they, they're in denial, they fight, they're violence. And we have to, you know, you have to manage that as well. Um, skilled nursing is much more, you know, when you come out of a hospital and you have to spend 30 days in a, in a, in a, in a, in a facility. Um, it's, not, it's not a long term. You don't stay there for two or three years. Um, that's not, a, that's not what, what it is for. So that whole continuum of care is, is when you provide all that, you have an idea as to what, what happens. One thing that I want to talk about is there's, there's a big myth, and I, and I love that part, that part because it's, it's, a, um, it's very telling how seniors age. And we t tend to think that seniors have no clue what's going on in the world. And, <laughs> and it is an absolute myth. And a perfect example is, is uh, if you look at the number of, of seniors who actually have tablets and phones and are connected, it's, it's increasing. Uh, uh, obviously, the highest market is, is the 18 to 25. Um, but the seniors went from, I think, in 2012 or 2013, it was 5%. And now it's about in the 40s. Uh, and it just keeps going up. And people are walking in with their tablets. They're expecting wireless to be available in the community. They, they want to stream Netflix. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's amazing how, how they adopt technology and, and how in they. In California, they organize day trips to dispensaries. Yeah. <laughs> Between Crystal and this, you know, okay. <laughs> Are you seeing this in your facilities? We do. You we say, for example, in the last five years, the use of electronic devices has increased by 30%. Oh, I mean, oh absolutely. Like we deployed, uh, we, deployed uh, we kind of beefed up our network because we knew something like this would happen. And I was kind of like, yeah, you know, we, we need to add bandwidth to the communities because people are going to be streaming things. So that's like a, a really critical piece of information. And the moment, yeah, right. the moment we did that and we went live with the, with some, in some communities, they would call us and say, so what's your guest password? Because I want to yeah. cancel my Comcast bill. And, and immediately they get on the, on the network and just start streaming. And you go, why is the network slow? We just beefed it up. We just <laughs> spent millions. And it's because everybody wants to get their, their wants to be on the internet. And it's amazing. And, and um, they, want, <laughs> they want a Netflix and chill. They want Netflix and chill. Uh, but you also have, you know, we try to do smart units in the community and try to put uh, uh, smart thermostats, smart lights, smart TVs, and kind of connect it all together. And basically the whole point is to give control back to the, to the resident. A big thing that people want to, they don't want to move into a community because they don't want to lose control of their environment. They went in their homes, they know their homes. Just, a, just as a, a resource uh, to pick on Jerry's question, uh, just a, uh, anything on uh, aging in place technology, Lori Orlov's uh, blog, Aging in Place Technology blog, uh, great place to go. Uh, it's also, you know, you'll see links to studies uh, you know that Gallup and others have done on the internet usage over, over, over time. It's free. Just make use of it. Yeah, and and so uh, things like virtual reality, uh, <coughs> technology that we think that seniors won't, won't love, and when you tell them, it's it's a very easy thing to to uh, reaction to see is when you tell them, hey, do you want to use Google Home? No. Do you want to use Facebook? Get this out of my way. I don't want to see this. Do you want to use uh, a virtual? You know, do you want to see something? No, I don't. You go back and you say, OK, that's fine. No technology for you, no problem. You come back to them two days later and you say, do you want to see your grandchild mm -hmm. in picture? You go, yes, absolutely. Here it is. Do you want to put a note on it? Oh my god, absolutely. And they commented. <laughs> Before you know it, you're using Facebook. <laughs> but they didn't know. And that's the thing is they're scared by the world technology. They, they're scared by the, by the whole thing. No, but they, they, this but is a bigger issue. And it's, it's a very important issue. And it gets to how do you speak to people Exactly. About the value of what it is you're creating, because it is not about the technology. Right. If you get into a conversation about the technology and what technology can do, you've lost them. Right. I, 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 I'm proposing a, a new framework of this. You know, it's not universal design. It's not design for all, which was a campaign I, I had with, at, at, uh, with the Consumer uh, Electronics Association years ago. Uh, to me, it's no learning curve technology. It's NLC tech. And it has to be, and that's why I'm excited about voice. Right. Because finally, we can put people on the bridge of the enterprise where they talk and stuff happens. And it just removes mm -hmm. the all of the friction, potentially, out of the user interface. But to Google Home and Alexa, well, to the frail woman who speaks like this, mm -hmm. Alexa doesn't. You know, and so even the designers there 
haven't played out. What are the use cases? And by the way, light is not the aggregation of use cases. Um, but what are the use cases that you know these technologies? They're not even thinking. Well, they're, they're not designing for seniors. That's something that we tell them all the time, and, and they, they are waking up to that. They're realizing that the, there's a silver tsunami coming over, right, in 2021, 2022, and beyond. And they're realizing they're developing for the 18 to 30 years but old. That's because they're calling it silver tsunami. There is nothing positive about a tsunami. Right. It is destructive. <laughs> there's a big wave coming. <laughs> <laughs> That is the question. So when we piloted that, the per unit cost, I mean, it depends on what you p implement in the, in the, in the unit. Uh, uh, oh, so what is, what is the per unit cost for the technology that you put in the units, and who pays for it? Um, that is the, the, the fundamental reason why not every single senior living community has already implemented the technology today, because they're still trying to figure out sometimes some of those. Uh, one of them is it depends on the technology you put in. So if you put sensors that cost $15, $20 a pop, and you put it together, uh, it doesn't cost you too much money. It's a couple of hundred dollars per unit. But you multiply this by 6,000 units, you got a budget for that, right? So that's number one. The thing is, it's not only how you implement it, but also how you manage it. Yeah. It, it, it. As a company, you can't just, kind of like when in your house, it's easy to go in and put in all the lights and smart lights everywhere and all the stuff, just one exercise. But then when it starts to die, you have to change them. You have to, it doesn't work. Why? Who do you call for this? Then you end up stuck and you call your... 18-year-old son or daughter who knows how to figure this out. Tech support. The tech support. Uh, you know, so, so there's that piece. Um, so who pays for it? Again, if you, don't, if you don't show the value proposition to the senior and to the family members, they're not going to pay for it because they don't understand the value of it. And again, it's remove that friction and really show the value just by, do you want Facebook? No. Do you want to see your grandchild? Yes. And that's what we have to really kind of work through. Uh, because when you come in right now and you say, we have smart units, D they don't know what that is. They don't care. But if you say, you have control over your, your thermostat, you can control the TV, just, and, and my mom can't move, and all you have to say is, turn on the TV, and I want to watch CNN, and boom, CNN comes up. That becomes something that they didn't have in their homes. If you don't add value to what they already have in their house, they're not going to move in. They, they don't have to. Yeah, absolutely. So to kind of piggyback on what he said, we um, have found that similarly, if you just ask somebody, you know, can I put this digital pet in your home, or you know, we're going to put some surveillance in your home. You know, we've had individuals uh, talk about our product as well. There's someone 24/7 watching you. Like we can help you. Um, yeah, that doesn't go over well with our launches. So we have found that, again, just letting the technology kind of speak for itself and turning our dogs and cats on and having somebody come and just interact with them. Uh, we, when we are doing an avatar launch, we have the individual just interact and have kind of a fun conversation. Um, so instead of saying, you know, this is the scary technology and kind of pitching to this idea that they can't wrap their head around, by having them just interact, uh, our dog will, you know, ask your name and what kind of music do you like and where are you from and are showing you pictures that you're gonna like. And immediately you can start to see the, the smile form, the, you know, how did they know that? And, oh, what else could I ask? And, you know, I really want some support on cooking healthy. I really should eat healthier. Can you show me recipes? And recipes start showing up and um, as they have this in their home by, you know, getting to know the individual, they, we start to select the kind of music that they would like or we can start to give more customized reminders for the individual. So really it's the technology itself that kind of wins the individual over um, without actually kind of beating them overhead and saying you're going to use technology. Um, we have to, honestly, um, when it comes from our, our health plans that are using the individuals, they do a little bit better of a job when working with our individual accounts. We often find that it's the, the daughter saying, mom, you have to use this in order to stay home. Like, um, so we, we try to work with our uh, clients on how to kind of pitch it to the individual. Um, we also have found that pretty much everybody, sorry to say this, but pretty much everybody wants to stay in their home. <laughs> um, so if you are giving a uh, solution to help them stay there longer and uh, safely um, by kind of addressing those social determinants like you were saying, uh, everybody's pretty welcome to actually having this little friend be able to help them. 
So when it really comes down to that's often our, our kind of conversation starter is what do you need um, help with? How can we help support you to be able to stay in your home and do that safely? And when they find that this little helper sometimes can do that, they're much more receptive to having this technology in the home. You know, one of, one of the, just to follow up on your question about cost, there's a debate in senior living as to how, how you price it, how you charge for it, right? And one school really is the old school, which is, well, you have it a la carte, right? So you have your core cost, and then, oh, and by the way, if you'd like to have a Google Home, we'll charge you an extra, right. you know, X, Y, Z. And then just kind of add on all these things. The fact is, is that in that circumstance, people all of a sudden only see price, and they say, no, I can do without that. I've done without it till now. I don't, I don't need it. Frankly, the case has to be made that these are things that are necessary, and you're selective on this criterion, are necessary to create the environment that enables the most fulfilling life Correct. for the people that are in Correct. that place. Right. And so you start with the goal and then say, okay, what do we need to do to, to create? Yeah, if I can just jump in. So that's another goal that we have at Care Coach is we often find that just older adults are just barely surviving, um, particularly sometimes in their own homes. But they're so stubborn half, half or they of want to that they're Half just of Medicare eligible, half of people on Medicare are eligible for food stamps. And yet they don't want to ask for that help or they're too proud to be able to. So we're finding that they're just barely surviving and we really want to help individuals thrive in the community. And we find by just offering these little supports sometimes throughout the day and this companionship throughout the day, we've seen them start to thrive in the community. Um, you know, they're falling less, they're visiting the ER less, they need um, less medication sometimes. You know, we have a bunch of QI partners that have happened in the community to show that just providing a little bit of extra love, support, companionship can really help them thrive in their communities. And if I can just jump in, because that is exactly uh, the point. When, when we talked about uh, elevating human connection for benchmark, is exactly that. It's, it's getting past beyond the senior living piece, because if you just talk about senior living, you're missing the connection piece. You're missing right. the, the, the social piece of it. Uh, and, and they're trying to tack it on as a, you know, we're doing senior living with social, uh, it's really, you have to look at it as a different package, and it's got to be included. So providing it, <coughs> providing the technology should be part of the package, should be part of the solution, part of the whole thing that we provide as a service, and not just a tacked on, oh, we thought about it after the fact because we want to compete with, with everybody else. So a, you know, pay an extra $200 a month and you'll get this. I, well, that goes back to follow my original question, but I agree with you. I think that in the housing, particularly uh, in new housing, if it's not built in from the very beginning in, in the planning stages, it then becomes a, 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 an obstacle, mm -hmm. a, a prohibition uh, uh, working against seniors. Because I tell you, five and six dollars increase in a, in a senior's budget is, can change the whole picture. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. It's totally unbelievable. And uh, so I think unless the infrastructure incorporates technology as opposed to adding technology makes a big difference. It can spread the cost over, obviously, a long, amortize over a long period of time. Right, well, it's so, going to be a long time, you know, life cycle before yeah. you have that kind of a replacement. And it's not just the infrastructure, it's also the processes and the actual care model itself yeah. that has to change. And this is something that, you know, when you build a, a community, you have to pay millions, right? You, you have a building that's dense walls. You can't just you know, let me just rip it out and rebuild it from scratch because that changed my mind now. Um, so you have to kind of really plan this, and that's part of the whole innovation piece. And again, part of designing for seniors, uh, it's they have their homes, it's already been there. You're not going to say, well, you got to rewire everything and it costs you $100,000, right? So it's like, what does that mean? In the back. Yeah. Uh, the best way to do it, I mean, there's multiple schools of thoughts here, but the one that I would probably push for would be is to bundle the pricing and actually build it in. Because right. once, once you build it in, it's, it's a lot cheaper to deploy, by the way, because you already thought through it in advance and it's the same, you know, uh, you don't have to retrofit anything. Um, a lot of the services are not so infrastructure heavy. Once you have internet in the community, there's a lot of things you can do. Uh, so you just have to leverage that. Uh, the cost, 
again, it has to be bundled in. If you don't bundle it in, it, it becomes a, a, a tacked on, a la carte thing that just doesn't look right. Um, and people feel like you're nickel and diamond them uh, like crazy. And, and you don't want to do that. Because you're not in that business anyway. It's more of a services and social thing that you're providing. Um, yeah, th th I think that's the what I would what I would say. It, it don't we don't look at it as a lot of projects with people people put in place is they don't say what's my ROI for this very particular service that I'm going to provide. We don't look at it that way. And I don't think you should because if you start to price out exactly okay, this is six dollars. Does it return my dollar back or not? It's just you, it's a losing battle, and it's the I hate that word, but it's the synergy piece of the whole technology software, you know, the whole solution that comes together. It's kind of like saying, when you have your iPhone and you, you don't have any apps, you have an iPhone that doesn't do anything besides answering the phone, but then once you put, put in the apps, what, what point does it hit critical mass, critical value for you, and you say, you know what, I can't live without my phone because there's all those five things that really matter to me, versus I only have one app, it doesn't do anything else, right? That's why the Windows phones died, and iPhones and, you know, Android phones kept going. Any other questions? We have these heavy hitters in the front, and I, I want to <laughs> make sure that. Yes? So thank you all for sharing your various perspectives. Um, as a client from this point, I spend a lot of time building things like ACOs and uh, for both the private side, but also working a lot in the Medicaid ACO space across the country, um, which is a growing thing here. So we're talking about more poor seniors as, as opposed to, to um, wealthier seniors. Part, what I'd love to hear from you all is talk, to talk about how you connect. So part of the struggle, especially when building something like an accountable care model to really to, to address social determinants, as, as well as health care, as well as mental health, we haven't really talked about that either, um, in, in seniors and their caregivers and their families, is that we, we create solutions that are often you know siloed, Silo, yep. and yet they don't connect to one another. So it'd be really awesome to hear how, from a biomedical, clinical side to both an engagement perspective to a housing perspective, how you all see what you're doing and what potentially is missing. Who's not on, up here that should be up here? Yeah. A lot of people are missing. <laughs> that was the easy question. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> right. It, it depends. No, but yeah. you know that that that's that's the uh, that gets back to the uh, don't let facts get in the way because the presumed fact is um, th that uh, there are these neat little boxes, and really it's about life. It's about living, and so it's everything under that umbrella, you know, which is very holistic, integrated, you know, et, et, et cetera. But anyway, go ahead. And I can okay. start. So we at CareCoach, uh, you know, we, we started as just a companion line, um, just trying to target individual families and have now tried to integrate. So we are working with different health plans. Um, we are working with home care agencies. We're trying to work, trying to work with insurance companies. Um, we are working with hospital settings. So we are trying to integrate. Uh, unfortunately, I would say a hurdle to that is that, uh, you know, a lot of times you need to prove your outcomes. You need money, yep. and time to do those. So how how have you gone about you know getting showing the outcomes, having the data to demonstrate the value proposition for a health plan? So at Care Coach, we've applied for grants. Um, we have quite a few grants, and from our grant funding, we are doing studies in the hospital setting. So we have funding through the DOD to work with the VA. Um, we have funding through the NIH. So we have a couple other um, big grants that are hopefully coming through soon. Uh, so you know that's how, in particular, to do our studies. Um, but studies take time; they take money, they take resources. So you know it, it just takes time to be able to kind of prove our outcomes, to be able to collaborate with other individuals. So we do still have our individual line, but we're trying to work with housing and, and all these different so that we can cross over because we realize that that's necessary to integrate with other solutions. What is the monthly cost? Of um, so really, it depends. Um, we don't publish our prices because our individual lines and our corporate lines are different. Um, I can say on average somewhere between uh, six to fifteen dollars a day um, for our service. So it really depends on what kind of account you have with us. I, I, I was just going to make one comment as, as far as drugs are concerned. There's a there's an interesting movie out there that Justin Timberlake is in. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's a horrible quality movie, but it's, it's worth a watch just from the point of view that it, it's, the, it's the movie where they've got the, uh, the, the length of their life on their arm, and the length of your life is determined by how much money you have. 
And we, we've watched that movie, and it's horrifying. Um, and one of the things we're thinking about very carefully is that if, if we ever were to come up with something that changed people's life as far as aging, it has to be available to everybody. Has to be available to everybody. And uh, we're thinking very hard about who, because you start off, in, in, the, in the drug business, in the therapeutic business, you start off with commercial people. If, if you're smart, at least the piece of advice I would give, start off with those commercial people who are gonna tell you who is gonna pay for it. Because you are gonna have to sink a lot of money in to get there and somebody's gonna have to pay for it. And we're looking at what that's gonna have to look like because it has to be available to everybody. It would be a, a disaster from a societal sort of point of view if it wasn't from, from our point of view. And that, and that movie sort of shows that in a, in a sci-fi sort of funky way. So uh, I, I always forget the name of the movie, but if you get a chance to watch, it's, it's, it's worth the watch. I would, I, would encourage a, I would encourage an additional movie, which is called Robot and Frank which is probably one of the best examples of what translates from imposed, think a life alert, right? Half of which are bought by adult uh, you know, children who are guilty, feel, feeling guilty. Half of them are in a drawer uh, because even the old and frail don't want to wear a neon sign on their neck that says I'm old and frail. And, um, and you have this circumstance, for those that haven't seen it, where the, ki the adult kids bring a robot home. It's a little bit in the future. The robot can cook and clean and carry on conversation. And Frank, the, the father, is just absolutely dismissive, dismissive, get it out of my house, et cetera, et cetera, until he sees purpose and what this thing can do to help him achieve his purpose which is robbing the library. But anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can just note that although we're not robots, we are um, avatars. And I would say similarly, the, I can tell you, and I, if anyone wants to talk to me about it, I can give you hundreds of stories of how our individuals are relating to um, our avatars and how much they start to actually have a relationship with their dog or their cat. We have individuals who, um, you know, pr profess things to their avatar that they would never tell anyone else. They talk about how this is a non-judgmental friend. This is a, a free therapist 24-7 um, to be able to talk to. Um, they also know that that avatar can contact their family or their um, care providers when needed. So having that comfort and kind of reducing their anxiety and nervousness maybe of living at home. And, you know, I, I encourage you to go on our website. You can see a little video of some of our participants talking about the actual relationship that they have. We've had people keep carting off to the ER saying, don't forget to tell Buddy that I'm not going to be home tonight. <laughs> Um, you know, or I, I forgot to leave dog food out for my dog. Um, you know, so they really do start to have a relationship with these robots or avatars, and that's yeah. it, it's a need. It's fulfilling a need that is is you know something that we need to address. It gets back to the connectedness that yeah. that Malay was was yeah, talking about. One thing that's funny is that we talk about elevating human connection, and we do it through technology, which sounds kind of intuitive, but it's really that's what happens with uh, that. Any other questions? Yeah, Jerry. Oh. Yeah, so I work for, He's in the dark. Uh, my name's Nate. I work for Two Life Communities. We develop affordable senior housing. I'm really energized by all the talk about affordability, making all this innovation accessible to everyone. So I'm not going to continue that because it's been really good. Um, but one other lens that hasn't been thought about, we have 27 primary languages spoken by our 1,500 residents. Um, so, and some of them are not the typical languages that you would think of that, you know, yeah. You can turn your iPhone into Probably something after like that. So how do we true. put all this information through a language lens wow. and make it available for someone who is 98 and speaks Shanghainese, the like dialect of Mandarin from Shanghai? Uh, yeah. I got me stumped there. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> we have a couple options. I care coach, um, but we are working on that. So um, stay tuned. I don't, I don't think anybody has, cr has cracked that nut. On, on the question of affordability, uh, one big thing is to, to realize that, that you know what the most expensive part of the whole model is is, is the labor, yeah. right? And which is in dire shortage. I mean, I think we have, we're going to have by the next five years 50% of what we actually need from two million to four million to two million people, and, and or nurses. And so, how do you provide care, uh, and and how much are you willing to pay for it? 
and that kind of creates, you know, strats, unfortunately. And, and if, if your labor cost is the most expensive part of your business, you have to increase your prices a little bit to make sure that you can uh, attract the right nurses. And again, you have to write qualified people that you really, and there's one thing that we, at Benchmark, for example, is we would, if you came to Benchmark and you tried to put your parent in there, there's one thing we would tell you automatically is we do not compromise on care, no matter what. We'd never cut, cut, cut corners. We'd never say, oh yeah, don't worry, just pay this much, we'll take care of your mom anyway, because we just don't compromise on care. That costs money. Um, and you have to hire the right people, you have to staff it right. Uh, you have legal requirements to staff your, your communities. You can staff less than a certain number of people depending on you know, morning and night shifts and everything else. You have to go above beyond that mm -hmm. because that's just the bare minimum so you don't get sued. But you don't want to think that way. That's how, not how a business should run. Um, so there's that, that component that actually adds to the... I don't know how familiar you are with the villages in Florida, <laughs> but they, were, they, were, they had that same issue and from a labor perspective. And they were much broader. I mean, you could be in a house for businesses living kind of thing. They partnered with Florida State University for that exact purpose, which which also increased their um, their likelihood, their, their, their decreased their turnover yeah. because people were had higher job satisfaction because they could see a track and that kind of thing. So there, I, I think there's a, actually more and more healthcare into lady BID Kansas Lady has a similar model where they create plans for everybody from environmental services on up and part and tries to partner with area universities in order to ensure that they have the right kind of labor out there and Kevin Tapp and pay me so I didn't I'm giving him some <laughs> 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 they, they just their merger. But I, I think part of it is we have to start thinking not just broader about how we're delivering care but also broader about where we're creating resources and partnering with local universities and that kind of thing and looking for labor in places that we have a tradition Correct. It's also Correct. Hard. So a, a startup that's in that space in Florida is Papa. And um, what they do is they basically provide a grandchild on demand. Drive you, you know, here and there, be a companion. <laughs> it's the fastest growing zip code in the country. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah, that SNS yep. kid is still true. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, what they don't what yeah, they yeah. what they need are, are condom dispensaries. <laughs> Are they, how do you train them? What are their... Sure. So our individuals that are operating our devices are called health advocates, and uh, most of them are abroad. So we currently um, hire, most of our individuals are actually in the Philippines or Latin America, because we do offer Spanish, um, speaking 24-7 as well. Um, and we have a very stringent hiring, screening, training process um, for our individuals. So um, they are monitored at all times. They are consistently trained in different programs. And um, you know, we, we screen everybody very highly. We actually only um, pass about 1% of our individuals that enter our training process onto um, actually being a health advocate for us. So it's pretty stringent. Do the advocates work with the same set of clients? Yeah. Uh, the, so the health advocates work certain shifts. Um, so usually because they're on certain shifts, they, they do have the um, same individuals at certain times of the day, uh, but they're not necessarily assigned due to, if I'm talking to, uh, uh, only we can only talk to two people simultaneously at the same time. So if you are one of my usual individuals and an emergency was happening, you might be talking to a different individual. But you are always seeing just the cat or the dog, so you're not, you don't know that a health advocate is changing behind the scenes. Um, when they're changing shift or if there's an emergency to happen. It is uh, text to speech. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Jerry. Um, one additional observation. We've been concentrating for a good part of the discussion about sort of later in life interventions, you know, certainly in, um, facilities, assisted facilities, or partial assisted facilities. But I think one of the important things. Allow me just to rant here for a moment. I think one of the important things is that it's what you said uh, about creating creating value, having a discussion about what is valuable. And for the entrepreneurs in the audience, I think that if you look at already established platforms that you can redefine in terms of the needs of people who are getting older, for example, one of the 
people that we wanted to try to get for the panel, but they weren't available, is a speaker company. It's a speaker company in Swampscott, right? A high-end speaker company. But they've redefined their product as one that deals with loss of hearing. Okay, so it's a speaker company. It's like a commodity business, right? If you define it in terms of loss of hearing, that all of a sudden redefines the product, redefines the market that you can go after. I'll give you another example. If you took a look at all of the safety devices that are built into cars right now, if you redefine them as you can add another five years to your driving life, a lot of people would buy the car. Pay a lot of money right. for that. So it's just an example of looking, observing how people are aging. Because we're not just talking about people who are over 70. I mean, a lot of our discussion has been that. But what Jody presented was this gigantic population of people that are turning 50 and will continue for the next 30 years and their consumption capabilities and so on. So it's important to pay attention to what's what they're paying attention to at 55 and 60 and 65 and how do you redefine products for what they're looking for. We've got to be observant, but there are enormous opportunities there. It's just my rant, sorry. Yeah, no, yeah, no I, I, I would, I mean, for entrepreneurs, what you're really saying, one of the things we're trying to do as a company is suck in information on what it means to be aging. Because what I would say to entrepreneurs is, is make sure you understand that, that what you're trying to do is actually valuable. Because I would say the one thing you see on Shark Tank, I, I do watch Shark Tank on occasion, it's sort of interesting, is, is when they say, oh, that's very cool, but nobody wants it, right? You don't want to be in that position. You've got to work out what people are actually looking for. What are the issues? And, and we have to do that even for diseases. If you read the textbooks about a disease, you'll, you'll never understand what the person who has that disease really needs right. until you speak to those people. Then they'll tell you, this is what bugs me about this disease. This is what I really need. Same is true for aging. We've all seen a lot of it because we watch our own families doing it and we're going through it ourselves. But we're, we're interested to know what are the real key points. What do people really need to make it to make it better, to make it good? You know. See, I I want to move away from just this narrow needs yeah. orientation. Once you focus on needs, it takes you structurally in the conversation into a conversation about negatives. You can't do this. You're having trouble doing that, and it's not like. Those needs don't exist. They do, it, et cetera. But it's how there are drugs that just do that, right? It's a, it's a, it's a, a drug is a point is the ultimate point solution, in that it's this. Right. You drop that, you feel better. You get you get better. These other things we're talking about are so influenced by the non-medical, and not just social determinants, but even the psychology of the individual. My mother is 89 with, uh, with dementia. Uh, she has an 87-year-old uh, sister. Before my mother's dementia, probably easily for 10, 15 years, when she looked in the mirror, she saw an old woman. And they, she dressed the part. She acted the part, and she still acts the part now with dementia. Her sister, 87, looks in the mirror today and sees a teenager, despite the fact that in 19, she was born in 1932, she had polio, was in an iron lung, has a leg shorter than the other. And you know, I, my wife and I were just talking about this the other night. You know, my understanding is when she was in her teens, she was fast and loose. You know, and frankly, she still is, <laughs> you know. But she wakes up in the morning, and it's like, I'm taking on the world. My mother wakes up in the morning, and she schleps around. And, and, and so you have those buckets. Then you have the people that really do have health issues, and those people who could have health issues, if we don't intervene now and ensure that they aren't lonely, that they aren't disconnected, you know, I, I was at this uh, session that Susanna Fox did at NASA. Susanna Fox was the former uh, CTO, Chief Technology Officer of HHS. And she did this with NASA, and they were looking at health uh, issues under extreme conditions. Well, what could be more extreme than outer space, right? Astronaut out in the black sky. 
taking pictures of the black hole. Mm -hmm. And um, but what occur what occurred to me was that individual may be physically isolated, can't get any more, but connected to at least hundreds of people who are monitoring the environment, who are monitoring their vitals. They right. can talk on uh, some video chat to their family, to, to Houston, to some fourth grade class that they're doing an experiment for. I mean, they are just connected up the wazoo, whereas you could have an older person in an apartment on the Upper West Side of Manhattan physically surrounded by thousands and connected to no one. And until we deal with those issues, we may not have solutions, but in designing even the technologies that have an individual purpose, your ability to address that use case, I would argue would be that much stronger if you understand the larger life context that that individual and category of individuals confronts. And I would say no matter what, whatever you create, whatever you invent, uh, don't do it in a silo and, and don't create it in an environment where just I'm solving this one purpose, this one issue, and that's it. And uh, make sure that it's connectable. Because those platforms themselves that we're developing, if we can hook them up with the other platforms, you're really missing a huge portion of the value add that you just don't get. Because if I'm solving that one problem, it's great, but now I have to buy 50 different applications to solve 50 different problems, and they're not talking to each other, my data is not going across, um, and I can't leverage anything. Uh, so that's, th that would just add that part. So Cody, uh, you've been very silent. Uh, well, I mean, what, what I'm doing is very, you know, um, I mean, the people using my technology are radiologists. You know, the people benefiting from it are everyday people, right? It's just, it's just the same people, um, you know, and I hope that one day, uh, you know, by creating biomarkers that are, you know, because we know brain changes happen 20, 25 years in advance. Um, we can measure that. We have large groups of people, but not on the individual level. So I hope that one day this type of technology will enable uh, drugs that, you know, are going to change people's lives to be implemented um, and, and change these people's lifestyle. But, uh, you know, quite frankly, I, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite different than, than some of these technologies we're talking about. So um, I guess um, my, my interactions with with the community are, are a little bit different, you know, so that's so, all. Yeah, it's, I don't have a lot to add to these discussions, and I love what you guys are doing. Well, I'm curious, though, about the messaging, but should we all subject ourselves to MRIs to be part of this data and say, like, what could be the messaging around? Well, right now, we're, good question. right now we're designing, you know, we're talking with clinicians at Internal Hospital and, you know, Brigham Women's Hospital and, you know, uh, you, you know at other, other hospitals and so on. Um, and, you know, we're, you know, I was, I was going to talk with uh, Malay later, um, and, you know, because we have to design the trials, and then we have to recruit people, and then we, so, so th in that sense, we're going to be connected, so this is a real, real interaction. <laughs> Should you get an MRI? I mean, MRIs are not dangerous. I mean, so that's one of the things about, you know, the uh, other imaging-based biomarkers, which has been funded by the CMS, they, I mean, they, they're, you, you get radiation exposure. You have to take uh, these radio tracers that you get a radiation dose. MRI gives you no radiation dose. Um, we do use a contrast agent, but we don't use gadolinium. We use an iron oxide, uh, you know, nanoparticle formulation, which is basically an iron supplement. It's, a, it's an IV iron supplement for people who need iron. Um, and so, um, you know, so there, there's no real harm that, uh, you know, uh, comes from these type of things. Uh, you know, and we talk about accessibility. Well, I mean, MRI scans can run, you know, uh, it costs me maybe less than it costs you because if you pay the health, you know, the, the insurer, you know, <laughs> you know, you pay the, the, when the insurance pays, it costs, it costs more. But, uh, but you know, $4,000 or something, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so, but, so you know, pay. but, but they're paying anyway. And so for these MRI scans and so on, so uh, when it's needed. So, um, you know, I think it's something that's safe, hopefully accessible as necessary. Yeah. And then um, ultimately will yeah. lead to the development of drugs that'll change these uh, you know, the, the, the our lives of our family and community members in, in a real way. And what are the ages of, of folks that you're either have been or plan to be involving in, in your tests? Is there is there a profile? Is there? So, I mean, ultimately, the age could be, you know, you come in, you know, uh, I mean, people go in for colonoscopies, you know what I'm saying? There's nothing wrong, you go in, 
Uh, you get, I mean, ultimately, you, you, you could go in when you're... No, you're ordered by your doctor. You wouldn't know this, yeah. but you are ordered yeah. by, by your doctor <laughs> at age 50 to, to, to do this. Just Nobody, get ready. Nobody chooses that. Nobody chooses I mean, I know what I mean, right? Yeah, I'm going to go get that. But, um, no, but yeah. the point is, I'll take the MRI. Ultimately, uh, the hope is that it would be preventative, you know. But for the for, for these studies, perhaps, uh, in terms of looking at, you know, as a, having a company and a market and somebody that will pay, uh, you know, we're looking at people with, you know, perhaps starting at with people who have uh, perceived mild cognitive impairment. Um, and so, so, to this point, this is where understanding who these people are is important. So what is the experience with older people with either mild or advanced, advanced you know, cognitive impairment lying in that MRI, listening to that clang, oh, feeling clang. like they're claustrophobic, yeah. et cetera, yeah. and is there a greater or lesser propensity for that reaction amongst this group of people. This is what I'm talking about in that understanding. It, it, having that understanding will even have benefits, I think, Absolutely. you know, yeah. for something yeah. like what you're doing, which the connection isn't so obvious. Well, and then, and then more than that, you know, what I, I mean, I, 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 I speak with a lot of uh, clinicians, you know, um, who never get into the MRI. Well, just, just, no, about the MRI. This is the doctor who tells you you have prostate cancer and tells you that the surgery will be very easy, and you say to him, have you had prostate cancer? <laughs> no, I don't want to hear it, you know? I mean, that, that's, that's, I, I'm even more empathetic than that. I'm, I'm interested to know, you know, what, what does this process look like for people? It's, it's not just the, I mean, it's, it's a years-long process, you know? Many different tests, many qualitative tests. You're going to go do cognitive tests. You got to go to the hospital now, uh, and, and and you got it. You got it. You got to go so often. You get followed, and they're going to look after you. And then you're going to go get an MRI anyway. And then so it's not just it's not. I, I don't just think about the MRI. Uh, I I'm actually really uh, because you know we we want to be able to replace those other things too. You know we want to make it as quick and painless as possible. You know if if at the end of the day you can you you know you can go in and just get one brain scan. And then it's all done, and we say, well, we, we know what's going on now. That would be amazing, you know, in my opinion. And I want to know, you know, from, from the patient's pers perspective, um, you know, I'm actually interested in hearing individual stories. And I've, I've, I've been thinking about, uh, you know, instead of just going out and interviewing clinicians, which is what I do, going out and interview, you know, interviewing the patient. Say, well, you know, what happened, you know, when you uh, had... You know, uh, you you first went to the hospital because you couldn't remember something. You know, mm -hmm. what was in your in your interaction? Oh, well, you took this test and it went so and so way, and then and then and then and then what did they ask for you to do? And what did you do? and how did that progress for you? Um, and so, because ultimately, I mean, people ask me, and I've been thinking about this. You know, who's the payer? Who's going to pay for? It? Who's the customer? Who's the cut? Oh, it's it's the radiologist. Uh, you know, maybe, but but it's actually the patients. You know, it's the people who 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 need it or want to get it done. And at the end of the day, a lot of patients, they request specific tests because they're afraid of something else, you know? And so I think the patient is actually the, um, the, um, the, the true customer as well. So I, I'd like to, to maybe also go out and interview and, um, you know, so it's on my mind, you know? Good. Will you ask your clinicians to go in and try it yourself? <laughs> to try an MRI scan? Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've done many MRI scans. I, I actually, even when I was testing the, I've tested software on Siemens machines, I've tested it on the, uh, you know, um, the GE machines, those are the two, and, and just to see, you know, which, which softwares are better, because everyone has different modalities uh, that, you know, d d components that we need to use, and then our images are, are, are um, you know, and, 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 and that quality analysis, when you look at the pictures, and I say, look at the quality, and I look at that over there, look at the cerebellum. That's my cerebellum. Right. So, right. so <laughs> when the same patient was kind enough to come on down to <laughs> California for a few tests this week, and fortunately, so, you know, <laughs> absolutely, yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I read the psychology study. They say that as the people get older, they start making friends. Mm -hmm. They are more focused on their uh, family. Uh, that's why it, 
is a reason, one of the reasons they become lonely. Is that true? <coughs> Uh, social isolation is a huge problem for seniors. Um, that's one of the reasons why uh, the whole human connection thing, I keep bringing it up because it's really what it is, is, is so important. And, and, and uh, solutions like uh, Kendra's are so important. Because they, they don't stop making friends. They just don't have the opportunity to make friends. That's the problem. And so they get, they get, they get locked, locked into their own environment and it's kind of like, you know when you're sick and you get comfortable and you, you, with your own sickness, your own disease, you have a cold and you're like, I'm in my bed, I'm comfortable, I don't want to move. That's how they are. They feel miserable sometimes or they feel isolated. They don't even know it themselves. Depression, isolation is, is, a, is a killer. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't know what to do. And the family, the, the adult child, like I said, is 70 years old or 60 years old or 50 years old and they have their own lives and they want to take care of their parents but they don't always, they can't always do that. And even if they can, they don't even, they don't understand. They're not in the business of knowing. It's kind of like the doctor. You, you don't self-medicate and self-manage your own disease because you, you don't know. You don't, it's not something you do every day. It's the same thing for senior living. You don't, you don't age. You haven't lived through it, so you don't know what your parents are going through. But then you notice a change, or it, sometimes it's, it's progressive and it's slow, so you don't notice it. But something happens over time, and they get locked in. They can't move as fast as they used to. They can't go shopping on their own. They want to drive. My grandmother drove until she was 98. And I told her when she was 90 to stop driving, she was going to kill somebody. And she stopped driving because she hit somebody. And the, cop took it, took, the cops took, took away her license. That's when she stopped. She wouldn't stop otherwise. But it was very important for her to drive. So the day we have self-driving cars, it's going to be amazing for seniors. <laughs> but, and it's coming up soon, hopefully. So, but that's, that the social isolation, is, is it happens because they can't. But they don't know it themselves sometimes. And they don't want to admit. They don't want to admit, I don't have any friends, I'm lonely, I don't want to. Yeah, I mean I'll throw back at the panel a bit of an analog monkey wrench to your observation, which I uh, resonate with. And that is that uh, solutions like uh, the technology solutions that Facebook, FaceTime, Netflix um, doesn't solve the problem. It provides uh, a vehicle for isolation. Uh, it makes it a lot easier to survive in an isolated mode. And I think the new solution you need entrepreneur who can connect your grandmothers with, oh, the lady left, her grandchildren. Yeah. What, what you need is real physical bonding. You were observing earlier uh, the difficulty of getting people out of the houses. A lot of it is the gravity of the familiar, but it's also that social network that is in that neighborhood uh, that they don't want to give up, and they're fearful that they're not going to be able to recreate it. It's a support network. And and you, and they they won't be it won't be recreated more yeah. more times than than not just to r respond to something you mentioned before about needs I, I, I challenged you before about your mom who's looking for an epiphany each time she gets up because I, I do believe in that um, how many in the panel uh, know the name uh, Abraham Maslow <laughs> a few of you yeah. well you know he uh, recognized a, a three-tier hierarchy of needs and one of the things that surprised me a little bit about the panel is that nobody got to the third level of needs. You know, there's so, many, there's so many uh, people who are aged now, they don't want to stop working. Yeah. Uh, they don't want to stop creating. Mm -hmm. They don't want to stop having a, a viable, challenging life every day. Right. It, they, don't, they don't just seek uh, the social, which is that critical second layer, or the custodial when they really you know, have those physical needs. They want all three. They need them. Yeah, this is a major issue with corporate America. On the one hand, they're losing their most experienced workers, and at the same time, they're complaining about multi-generational workforces that are hither and dither, and they can't figure it out how to how to manage it. Um, you know, there's very few studies that are quantified that show the benefits of a multi-generational workforce, and the and the the most famous is uh, from BMW which had the foresight to kind of do a scenario uh, exercise to uh, look out, I don't remember what the time frame was, but call it 10 years, and then say, what will the demographics of our workforce be 10 years from now? And then what they did was they took that distribution, uh, that worker dist age distribution, and created a, an assembly line 
with that distribution and then went to those workers and said, so what, would, what could we do that would improve productivity, make your job easier, greater satisfaction, this and that. There were a bunch of recommendations made. They all cost, in total, $50,000. <laughs> and, uh, and that production line had the highest productivity across BMW, the lowest absenteeism not just been in the plant, but across BMW. And you know, it, it just said to me, well, what if they were to like, you know, uh, nationalize that or, or, or you know, do it through the plant? through the, uh, the company, through the industry. I mean, th I think the productivity jump was like literally 7%. That is huge in economics. I mean, that is a mega number. I mean, if you could, you know, level, you know, do that at the level of an industry, it would be unbelievable. But nobody has done this kind of uh, work and modeled it in other places. One of the things I want to find somebody who would be interested in doing, in the late 90s, right down the street at Sloan and uh, at Harvard Business School and every place else, the hot thing was teams. And it really came out of the consulting industry, you know, McKinsey in particular. Everybody, every thought leader in consulting had a book about teams. And some people actually started looking and quantifying productivity and outputs from this different organization of work. What I want to find is somebody who's willing to model the involvement of older, experienced workers in a model that leverages the age advantage. Because that's something that has not come up in, in this discussion. And that is there are a bunch of things that get better with age, including sex. <laughs> so um, fact. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not you know, <laughs> if you can, no if you people synthesize better, I mean, you know, if you think of the, the, the book Blink, why is it that somebody can all of a sudden seemingly pull an answer out of the air? No. It's out of years of experience, and the brain has this ability to just quickly zip, up, up, there's the answer. You know, older people can do that better. They're socialized better. They want to teach. They want to mentor. I mean, there's all these advantages that are tangibles and intangibles that need to be modeled into the work environment, white collar, blue collar. It, it, it's, it's just, like I said earlier, it's leaving money on the table. And it's linked to finding purpose, back to your point as well. It's the, the finding the purpose is incredibly important. And, and it's, but it's yeah. creating, and again, it kind of goes back to both points, I'm kind of circling back around, but it's creating the, the, the opportunity to, to have, help people find purpose again. That's that's the social that's the co to combat social isolation is exactly that is if you actually create the opportunity and, and the options for people to to uh, find a purpose and find something a new meaning to what to to wake up in the morning and say you know what now I can paint and I want to paint we have people who were torn in we discovered they were they painted their whole lives and they couldn't paint anymore because their fingers couldn't move anymore you give them a paint app and suddenly the paint technology and they're like oh my god now I can paint again. Whereas before they couldn't, they could even hold the thing, but now with just their fingers, they can do this. And they, they, their attitude towards you know, the, the, the setting where they live now is completely different, because now they just love it. So we're gonna cl we, ha we have to close, but I'm going to close on, on the last point. My mother-in-law, who's 98, turning 99 in uh, the beginning of, of June, uh, at 96, after her husband died, decided, OK, I'll go into assisted living. This is a woman who I took, who used to live right behind the Prue at, at one of the Avalon buildings. Took her out and her husband out uh, for dinner on, uh, uh, on Newberry one night. And they were just starting to look at, at assisted living places. My mother-in-law, who was an actress and, and uh, a director and then taught acting and directing at Emerson for 30 years, uh, she leans over to me. She was 96. And she goes, Jody these people don't look well. <laughs> <laughs> and she could not, and this is a woman who, who was doing Pilates and yoga 40 years ago. We would joke, where's Shirley? She's doing her exercises. This woman's come back from two pelvic fractures. Why? Because she's been doing her exercises her, her entire life. But what was it? Why did she pick of the six places we went to, the place where she ended up? the art studio, because yep. she took up 
painting at the age of 74 in Oaxaca, Mexico, and she's a little grandma Moses. And she's been painting ever since, and she could see herself in that room. That and food. <laughs> and food she didn't want to cook for herself anymore. <laughs> so thanks very much. Please th help uh, thank the panel.